two, one. What's going on, everyone? This is Ryan with Hard Money Bankers for another episode of Market Makers with my partner, Ian. What's going on, Ian? Not much. Just hanging in there. Yeah, yeah. Another another busy Wednesday, February. You know, I was just talking to Ashley before the show. Oh, by the way, this is Ashley, and I'll give you a better introduction, Ashley. But we were just talking how, uh, you know, like the, the seasons of real estate since COVID have been out the door. Like, one February is busy right now. What? <laughs> um, so... Uh, yeah, that's, that's what we're dealing with. So, okay, well, let me get the proper introduction here. So this is Ashley Olson, if you're not familiar with her, uh, North Jersey real uh, attorney in real estate. Uh, she's the owner of Molson Law Firm. She's been doing this for up to 10 years. Probably next time you see her on the show, she will be over 10 years. Uh, she works with investors navigating the acquisition process and all of that. In fact, we're going to talk about something, a new service of hers that, that she is adding uh, but more importantly, I think uh, Ashley is the new age of of legal and attorneys. Uh, you know, it, the old school way is kind of like pressuring you like you're on my like ask your question fast as you can, because, you know, I'm clocking you right now. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Ashley will actually like listen to you and talk to you as a person. Um, and, and, you know, we had a show with her before. Key thing is don't 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 mistake kindness for weakness because Ashley knows her stuff. She she is an expert. She's somebody you want in your corner. She just does it in a manner that you also feel good as a client. You feel like you're talking to a person. So, Ashley, I hope that's a, a warm introduction for you. Very, and, thank and you. Thank you for joining the show. As always, you know you always have great insight for us in, into the market, what's going on. So, uh, let's start there. What how how have I mean? It's been maybe a year since we've had you on. How mm -hmm. have things been going for you? Yeah, so um, something that I've noticed in the current market is actually a shift of a lot of professionals wanting to put pressure on investors specifically. Um, so because I'm known for doing work with investors, I'm getting a lot of calls from various professionals like knocking down my door asking me, how do I work with more investors? <laughs> um, so there's like a kind of internal pressure uh, coming from being known for working with investors. Um, there's also like a distaste for being part of the rat race to kind of rely on other people to generate business. So I'm seeing a lot of um, professionals and, and a lot of people shifting their business models to trying to figure out ways to get direct to either their consumer um, or to partner with people who they don't really have to feel like they're chasing business down. Um, and that's especially because the pay to play you know, business model doesn't really work. I always said um, when COVID was at its height, like money talks until it doesn't. Um, so <laughs> we're at a place now where people actually have to kind of back up, you know, what they're selling themselves in terms of how they're working. Uh, so there's that. Um, volume's definitely down uh, for everyone. Uh, I think that that's not talked about enough. The, we probably touched on that in our last podcast um, that we did together, that we were getting um, into that camp where volume was going down. Mm -hmm. Now it's been down. Um, and as you mentioned, when it first uh, the episode first started, like people's seasons are changing. So where you might be having a busy month, someone else might be having a slow month. We're all over the gamut um, in terms. We don't have like a actual streamlined um, season for everyone all at once. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty out there for agents right now with the commission lawsuits and people kind of like either going forward, pretending that nothing's going to change, you know, then there's other people who are like, oh my gosh, things are changing tomorrow. So there's a lot of buzz just in the kind of agent community about that and professionals trying to figure out what's going to happen to, you know, me and how I serve people if this drastically changes as well. I, you just hit so much and it was all <laughs> awesome stuff. I mean, I, that kind of displays just like your knowledge of real estate and being active as to what is happening right now in the moment, um, which is why you need to reach out to Ashley uh, if, if you're in real estate. She will keep you appraised on everything. Can we dive into what you just said about the the realtor commission thing? Because yeah. as a lender, I don't stay too focused on it, but I 
I know about what you're saying, you would be a perfect person to ask. What what is going on there? Yeah, so um, essentially, there's a lot of different kind of copycat lawsuits that have been filed in various different locations and jurisdictions. And decisions are either coming down where there's been like jury verdicts, awards, and or settlement agreements being put into place. Um, the biggest thing that's happening right now, like the most current aspect of it, is the Department of Justice has had a mission, um, a very clearly stated mission of wanting to uh, pre uh, preempt like the the way that commissions are structured and to change it. <laughs> is that just <laughs> for New Jersey or nationwide? Huh? Just New Jersey or nationwide? Nationwide. So the Department of Justice, um, they they would like to see um, the sellers from being uh, prohibited from offering a commission to buyer's agents. So what they want is buyers to be forced to either um, negotiate directly with their agent and or if they're they want the seller to pay, they have to kind of like put it in their offer. And so they can ask sellers. This is what the DOJ is proposing. Um, they can ask sellers to cover the commission, uh, but the seller, the seller can't put it in their um, stated MLS disclosures. So the DOJ is like filing these statements of interest in the lawsuits where settlement agreements are being reviewed or approved by circuit court judges. And they have, again, made it very clear that they don't feel that the way things are right now, and even with the settlement agreements and the um, current changes that have been put in place are enough. They say they're just cosmetic changes. And um, I don't think that it's going away, you know, anytime soon. What's the... uh who's why are they involved what, is that not government overreach what am i missing here <laughs> <laughs> well it the government is worried about anti competition so they're they're worried about price fixing and they have full jurisdiction over when there's like a national um price fixing operation that's been put into place but so, how, why would they say that like you have so many brokerages price fixing would require all the brokerages to Right. Um, but you have like this common practice that is put into place where everyone's doing it the same. And they if you uh, want, I can definitely send you some materials from like the evidence that was put forth in some of the cases, which yeah. has obviously helped the DOJ. Um, <laughs> and in their case, they get to see, you know, everything that's being put in the complaints and the public record. And they've also had various um, like discussions with like the NAR and the MLSs. Um, so there's there's definitely like a national standard of how commissions are paid in the United States. And mm -hmm. the DOJ um, has a this is their stated um, their stated responsibility to protect homeowners, buyers and sellers from the anti competition that's happening. So it's it's quite interesting um, when when you look at the different perspectives of, you know, the, the defendants and you you have the plaintiffs and then you have the DOJ. So there's all these different. Who are the defendants? So the, I mean, all the various brokerages that you could imagine <laughs> and their parent companies and also the MLSs and NAR. Wow. I, I mean, how did, how is that impacting what you do uh, on like a day to day? Like, is this something that, um, yeah, what, what are you waiting for to happen from your perspective? So it's not impacting me directly right now. Um, however, if let's say something gets put forth and, and I like to try to imagine and prepare for if this were to happen, if sellers are prohibited from offering commissions and it does so happen that buyers have to start negotiating with the agents, um, my thought is that that is going to completely shift the discussion of value of what is being actually offered by agents and buyers actually realizing what they've actually been paying for, but they didn't really know it, you know, because the prices of the real estate have always kind of accounted for sellers recognizing what their net will be if they're using a realtor on their listing. Um, and sellers aren't going to want to change like the price that they could get. So the prices are probably going to stay the same. So mm -hmm. the buyers are going to be the ones that are kind of asking questions, like trying to figure out what they pay their agents. And I have a feeling that if buyers are like, well, hey, agent, I'll give you a thousand dollars. 
you know, that there's going to be a whole shift of responsibility put on the attorneys to do things that we would otherwise do in like a FISBO transaction. Um, mm. So I'm just kind of preparing to either shift my services to be much more hands-on FISBO type, even if there's an agent involved. Um, and we already do that, you know, with like um, uh, fixed fee listing agents and things like that. So it's really just figuring out now um, how to price things, but I don't, I don't know when that's going to happen and if that will come, you know, in six months or if it'll be five years from now, but it seems like the trajectory is that there will be change. It's just nobody knows when. Um, and then on the professional side, a lot of, um, I, I want to collaborate with people about it. So I'm very active in talking about it on social media and kind of putting myself out there to ask people, what are your thoughts on this? What are you going to be doing about it? Um, because I think that the last thing everyone should be doing is having a delusion like that. It's not going to change. Um, and if it never does, at least you could say you were prepared and, you know, we were collaborating and talking about it. What, so, what's your personal opinion? Um, my personal opinion on what? Uh, should we be going this direction or is this not a good direction to go? Um, I think that in countries where it has shifted where there's kind of more competition available that the cost of buying and selling a home has become more affordable and i think that that's ultimately good for the consumer i think letting the market dictate the the um kind of like who gets paid what is good i i do think that if you let the market also dictate you're going to have um, people who come out of the woodwork agents specifically who are like hey this is my value and this is what I'm really good at. And they're going to kind of level up and become more career and professional oriented. Whereas, you know, right now you have kind of this opportunity for everyone and anyone to make 3% or 2% mm -hmm. or whatever it might be, regardless of what they do. <laughs> you're so, going to have though with that, you're going to have an effect of, you're only going to like, you're going to have 10 agents in an area complete. That's your agent. Like it's not going to, your barrier to entry is going to be way harder. Yeah, I think that um, there's going to be a lot of confusion um, mm. if there's like a very um, strict rule that's put in place right away. Yeah. Um, and and I don't think that that will be good for the market. Um, I, I think that buyers and sellers and like how, how who's going to educate everyone on how to talk about it? You know, where is that going to come from? Mm. Um, is it going to come from the brokerages who have been defendants in these lawsuits? Right. I don't know. You know, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> the NAR is already proving that, like, they, they don't really um, you know, have much guidance, you know, to provide. Maybe so, uh, we can grab like a bill, a billion that's going over to Ukraine and just slip it into the real estate industry <laughs> for teaching purposes. Maybe just slide it on over and see what right, happens. Like, right. like you're, you're right. Like, what's the infrastructure going to look like? Yeah. To pull that off because it's it's like in, in a major industry overall. Yeah. And a lot of the countries that um, the plaintiffs were using to support their lawsuits are countries that have kind of always had the competition in place. So they never had to go from what we're doing to shifting, um, shifting the structure and shifting the pay structure. So I think that um, it, it would be really messy if there's like an injunction, you know, put in place. And right. A change has to go forward immediately and then you have consumers who don't even know they're not paying attention to this so you know I mean, uh, are there other countries that have not even you know yeah are there other are, <laughs> are there countries that have been in our position and then successfully made the shift that i'm not too sure i don't i wouldn't be able to answer that right now but it, it's possible but i know a lot of countries like for a long time have had a different structure I mean, it's wild that, that uh, the day and age that we're in, like you're as, as an attorney, you can look at other countries and see what happened. I mean, you do that in anything, but, you know, it really hasn't been, I'd say, to the last 10, maybe even 20 years where it was just you're just looking at United States. You know, that was your scope. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so so real estate and many industries are just in a new uh, space right now. So it's kind of a uh, we're all figuring out as we go. Mm -hmm. And you can refer to these other countries and see what happens, but it's still not quite, you know, one to one replica of what happened there is going to happen here. So I appreciate you uh, sharing all that, though, and, and you know, it just shows your your breadth of knowledge on, on all that. Um, I think that could possibly segue us here into, I mean, you you work with investors. I mean, mm -hmm. is this what they can expect? Like what, what's what's your new program that you're offering for, for people that are coming to you? Um, 
like, is this kind of information part of it or tell, tell us about that? Yeah. So it's, um, it's actually slightly different. Uh, it, I think that agents uh, or investors that are working with agents, you know, they may, um, want to, uh, follow along with what's happening because if a deci decision does get made, you know, especially on the fix and flip side, if they're going to flip and sell the property, you know, they can certainly have like a candid discussion with their listing agent as to what's happening with buyer commissions. Um, they may also feel that they just want to pay a buyer agent, you know, so like the whole discussion of where value is, is I think is really what comes out of it and what every buyer, seller, investor um, should be thinking about is where do you find the value uh, and, and where do you want your money to be going? So that's kind of one way that I would segue it. But in terms of what I'm shifting my firm into um, offering is um, unrelated, but it's focusing on offering what's called pre-acquisition diligence to my investor clients. So um, one of the old school uh, ways of practicing real estate law is don't come to me until you have a contract. Mm -hmm. And um, usually by that time, you have an investor who's locked in a price and they kind of have an idea of like what type of you know diligence they'll be doing on the property. Obviously, the more creative of a deal it is, the more complicated the diligence will get. But at that point, you have a seller who's if they're working with a lawyer specifically on the other side, they're going to be expecting a deposit. Um, you may also be looking to assign the transaction. You could have a buyer who has concerns. So um, there's a lot of research and work that can be done to support an investor from the attorney's perspective before they even go and lock up a price on a deal. Um, and some of the things that will come out of the woodwork may even impact what price they offer. Um, the best example I can give is title searches, um, making sure that whatever you know number you're working with will actually be doable for your seller. Um, like, can do, are they going to have to bring money to the table? Because that'll usually kill a deal. So that's like the most basic. But then you also have um, you know the parties involved. Who are they? You know, are they are they good people? Do they have trouble? <laughs> um, do they are there are they is there legal trouble um, that they're in? And then you may also have um, plans for that property that the deal doesn't work unless you can, you know, do certain um, things to it when you're fixing it and flipping it. So my uh, thought was a lot of my clients feel like they can't even come to me until they have a contract because they want, don't want me to give them free advice, which is great. I have amazing clients who like don't want to call me and waste my time, which is awesome. Um, but at the second, uh, the second uh, aspect of that is I want to be able to support them in getting their, having their deal be more successful um, and not having a deal fall apart during actual due diligence of the contract. So I sat down and um, thought about, you know, what is some way that I could balance out getting compensated, right, for time, but also providing my clients with the opportunity to have an actual like analysis done from the legal perspective on their deals so that when they do go under contract, they lock in their price. They have a lot of the legwork done for them already and their actual diligence period, which we know, you know, could be 10 days, 14 days. Um, there's not too much to do. You know, it's like just what it, what's the scope of work that needs to be done here? maybe an oil tank sweep, that kind of stuff that you can't do until you lock up. So that's one facet. Um, there's others, but I'll pause there just in case you want to chime in. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's fantastic because I wish every person who came to us had has, has spoken because like everything you just said is what we end up doing as the lender, mm -hmm. um, but it'll happen over like time. And it's like, I wish everybody, and, and you know who does do it? The exp experienced investors who, who know like the game, they've done that. They, yeah. they did exactly what you just said. So, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm thinking like I got to refer people to. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, I actually have somebody uh, an idea before after the call for Ashley. You know, she's mentioning this because it's 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 like it's 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 like the it's not the fun part of the deal. You know, you want to get it under contract, you want to move, but there's nothing that is worse than doing getting it under contract and then dragging a bunch of parties into the play just mm -hmm. to find out you didn't <laughs> to get the, you know things up front. They should have hammered out, especially on a, like a commercial deal. Like if you're in like a million or two million dollar transaction you know, um, that I could see that you could stream. I know why this would be really valuable. I'll talk to you Ashley after the call, something that you might want to look at too, but it's a very yeah. valuable service. 
Thank you. And, and I was thinking that this would definitely benefit people who are partnering, partnering with lenders um, because some right. of the stuff is, is information that you may also not find until after you close, you know, depending on what type of diligence you're doing in when you're in contract. Um, and the last thing you want is to, you know, be stuck with a mortgage where you're, you're, um, borrowers aren't able to act on the deal the way that they wanted to pay you back um, and or pay you back in a timely manner. Um, so it kind of benefits everyone. And um, my goal is just more successful deals for my clients. Um, and and I think that in this market, one of the you know current aspects of it is deals are a lot harder these days, um, even if you're working with land, right? Like every time land gets bought, you have less and less, you know, available. And usually what's available is more complicated. So how can, you know, this, this new service come into play? Um, and then on the, the uh, post-closing aspect of it is a lot of investors are usually left from their transactional attorneys with like, no communication whatsoever, and they have to deal with their contractors by themselves. So I'm offering um, what usually is available to like um, high net worth investors who are in commercial space, which is kind of like contractor management post closing, you know, getting lien release waivers signed, um, following up on, um, you know, payments from the contract, making sure the contractors have received their payments, um, keeping the paperwork and the receipts in order. Um, making sure that, you know, the lender can be supported with whatever draw, you know, request is being put forward. So just supporting the investors post-closing from, you know, the le legal aspects of things as well um, will be supportive because we've also had um, situations with our investor clients when they go to sell that we ask them, you know, how was it, <laughs> right? How was, you know, working on the property? And they're like, oh my gosh, it was a nightmare. Um, and, and I'm like, oh, I could have been available for that. How do I, you know, structure this so that it's like, actually clear that I'm available for this. And um, we're not just leaving them hanging to dry in that respect. Yeah, well. and that's a good service because I can't, like I always tell people the two places that you die in a deal are in the purchase, you pay, you pay too much, that's you're dead out of the gates. And then in the execution, mm -hmm. which is like, oh, I got a great deal. And next thing you know, your $40,000 budget just went to 300 grand. You got a contract, you're suing you. Mm -hmm. That's where, I mean, those are the two places that you're going to fail like um, or succeed. So. I mean, you're, 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 you're offering a service to take out one of those places right out of the gates, you know? So I, I think that's, there's a lot of value there. Definitely, definitely on the bigger construction projects, like mm -hmm. a, a million dollar construction project, you don't have room, you know, a mistake is 200 grand. So you, right. you're in trouble. Yeah. But even from like the smaller, you know, single family home, right. Every single dollar can, can eat into sure. your bread. So if you could, if you could have gotten something like a change order, you know, put to get put forward or sooner than later, um, a lien waiver signed, like all of that could be, you know, it could be money. Right. And, and yeah. so when you're looking at like a 50 K spread to a hundred K spread on a deal, like everything matters, um, from that perspective as well. So I think it's, it's really taking what larger, um, commercial institutional investors have and providing it for the smaller investors who are doing single family properties, multifamilies, um, and, and providing access to, you know, legal services in an affordable manner, um, that is, just um, conducive and convenient and and flexible to kind of work with their needs um, in a way that again like the larger investors you know could hire like an actual con construction um, manager who is a law firm to support them um, which is a completely different um, service but there's parts of it that can apply to these situations I mean to me this is one of those things where it's like, how could nobody like like as you're doing? I'm like, how how has no attorney done this before? I'm like, yeah, I guess it really isn't out there. So like, I I think what you have is is amazing there, and I think it's awesome Thank you're offering you. it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really really looking forward to offering it, and I'm, I'm literally in launch phase of it. Um, so excited. This is kind of the first time I'm talking about it live, other than in small, um, you know, intimate settings. And uh, even for me, the more I talk about it, I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> it, it fits, it fits. There's definitely yeah. like, uh, though, I think the thing will be the biggest thing with it will be creating like, for a lot of people, I think it's going to be a, um, like another step in their mind. But the yeah. reality is like, 
just do the right thing. Like it's the right thing to do for your deal. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like getting insurance. You're like, mm-hmm. well, that's what uh, it's risk management, right? Yeah, it's risk management. Yeah, yeah, yeah but like, people, but do it, it, it. You know? Yeah, they and they hear. You know, they talk to the the uh, insurance salesman, right? And they're like, I don't need it, which you know, that's not the ideal person for it. But yeah. there are certain investors, um, as Ryan was saying, like the um, really good investors will do this work right. and this is probably like what's better for that investor to be doing is probably making calls. So if they could just say, Hey, Ash, here's the property address. Here's the seller name. You know, here's my end buyer's name, whatever information I need, they can go ahead and they can continue making cold calls, get more deals. Right. And like, I can take that offload from them. Yeah. You're buttoned up uh, professionals. We'll, we'll use this. They, yeah. they will. Um, I mean, the range, it's a range, right? I mean, for, for anybody who's just starting those buttoned up professionals, had to learn the hard way and lost money and time by not doing this. So right. you see, you're helping the new investors there and then the buttoned up professionals. So that's your gambit. You, you cover it all are going to see the value of this immediately. Yeah. So it'll spread word of mouth. Too. It'll spread word of mouth because it'll happen and people will be like, look, you just got just included this in, in the transaction, just build it in as like a cost and it'll mm-hmm. save like because of one investor will tell another investor that's how it'll 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 spread word of mouth right right and the one of the ways that i'm looking to offer it is actually like a subscription kind of service so Good, yeah. like you can um basically pay me a monthly fee and have access to you know one to two pre-acquisition diligence deals per month um analysis and then um if you don't use it, you know, we'll figure out, you know, some way to work around that. But the the idea is that you don't have to worry about, you know, paying me every time and like having a, like a um, heavy discussion, which is, you know, usually again, the old school way. It's like, first I have to get the attorney on the phone. They're not available. Um, they're busy. So it's kind of like, I, I, you're letting me know you want me available for this and I'm letting you know, I will be available for this. And there will be like a streamlined way for it to be provided and available so that it doesn't feel like an extra step, which I think is, you know, on point that, you know, people will definitely feel about well, it. That well way. thought out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now it's just, how do I take pre-acquisition diligence and make it shorter? <laughs> <laughs> shorter, shorter, more efficient, right? Always. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so it's yeah, easier. Yeah, we've been trying to do that for 15 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so actually, I mean, we're, we're over time, but I don't care because it's always great talking with you. How can anybody get in touch with you if, if they want to, get these services or just ask you any legal questions, whatever it may be. Yeah. So um, I will not give legal advice on social media. So (laughs) if you want to follow me just to get to know me better, I'm extremely active on Instagram. Uh, My handle is at real estate law and J. So I try to make that easy. Um, If you do have a deal or a question that you want to send to me, you could email me at Ashley at MolsonLawFirm.com. And um, otherwise, if you do follow me on Insta, you can D- DM me and, you know, I can take it from there if you forget my email. <laughs> awesome. And it'll be posted on the email when this goes out. So, Ashley, appreciate you as always. You're always, you, you know, t- tearing down walls, right? It's like, it's, that's kind of what you do. It's great. Uh, <laughs> Trying uh, to. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Awesome to see. So, Ian, Ian, you got anything you want to add? Or? No, I think it's great. I think it's yeah. really yeah, smart. Thank Good you, stuff, guys. Ashley. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming on the show and we will see you next time. See you soon.